Hey. Hey. I think this actually is just, we're just kind of waiting to see if somebody is going to begin us, but we will begin ourselves. I'm Ann Patchett. And I'm Margaret Wrinkle. And we're here together in my living room in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're really sorry that the Southern Festival of Books isn't live. And we're really glad that the Southern Festival of Books isn't live for those very different reasons. You will get to enjoy the sound of my dog Sparky barking in the background. And if we were all together out in the legislative plaza right now, we wouldn't be hearing Sparky. But something else, we'd be hearing all kinds of other things. That's right. That's right. Starlings. So we're here today to talk about Margaret's book, Graceland at Last. Oh, there you go. That's I, it. We're flipped in the screen, so it's a little hard to figure it out. Look, it matches. I, there I you... picked this out. Mary Laura helped me. Mary Laura oh. Philpott helped me pick this outfit so that it would match my book. That's, you've got to get it in the screen. That's very, very nice. Okay. And um, it is Notes on Hope and Heartache from the American South. And it was a purchased signed copy at Parnassus Books. And it is a collection of your op-ed columns from the New York Times. S selected. Selected. Mm -hmm. And it's also your second book. My second book. Um, late migrations being the first one. Mm -hmm. If you are coming late to this party, and I can't imagine you are, you also need to get late migrations. So one book not being enough, you should get two books. <laughs> um, how did you decide that you wanted to do this? It wasn't my idea. I didn't decide it. I was actually a little bit horrified at the idea, but um, the New York Times has a book development department. And um, Caroline Kay, who is the um, who is who runs the show, um, had the idea of putting this book together. I she, didn't know that. She came down to the Southern Festival of Books and she heard our conversation at War Memorial Auditorium when Late Migrations came out and the Dutch House. They yeah, were yeah. both brand new books. And um, and we had arranged to meet for coffee. We had a good long two hour conversation. And she just had the, she didn't know exactly. She didn't have any strong feelings about what the book should look like. She just wanted to do a collection of columns. And, um, and at first I was like, Ugh, I don't think so. Why would anybody want that? Something like that. Right. It, the, the, the stuff is already out there at the New York times. And then um, I realized uh, what she pointed out how deep in the bowels of the archives some of those things are. And it, you would have to know how to look for them to find them. And so, you know, there's it's just not like you've been doing this for 20 years. No, but I mean, I've done probably, I mean, I've done more than 200 of them. Are you kidding me? So they go back and then, then times is just dumping in like 40 uh, new things, 150 new things every day. So it does take, you have to be able to spell my name, A. Okay, that's And tough. you have to be able to, you go, okay. Margaret wrote, at some point, Margaret wrote a piece about the Night Blooming Series. How do we spell Margaret's name? How do we spell Night Blooming Series? And then you have to be able to find it. And so it is a little bit, it, I could see that it would start to make a little bit of sense. And then I had, I thought about how I could put it together. And anyway, that's how it came about. Well, how you put it together is what I really want to talk about today. And, and there are there are two kind of overarching themes that I want you to touch on as we go along. One, the idea of coming up with new ideas week after week, not running out of ideas, but also writing at a pretty consistent length. You know, I, I write mm -hmm. essays that are incredibly long and then tiny short. I'm, and I'm so interested in length, but you're really constricted. I mean, your, your pieces have got to be pretty much the same length. Yeah. And that's very interesting to me. So, the book is in six sections mm -hmm. and I have them all written down. Um, so let's start just there. How did you decide that you wanted to do the book in six sections and how did you pick the sections? Well, I remember emailing my editor at the times. This is before I had written a book proposal and, you know, my editor, my publisher, Milkweed Editions was um, involved at all. I was just thinking through what would it look like? <clears throat> should it be like a greatest hits? Should I know which ones 
I think you know, we should look forward and not look. I keep I'm looking at you, okay. but I Especially think Especially if I turn towards you, you see this giant bug bite on my cheek. All but right. So we're just going to look forward and, you know. The, um, the, yeah. So the, the, the first idea I had was just sort of like, let's just put the ones in there that everybody likes that aren't controversial, that nobody yelled at me <laughs> on Twitter about just a happy book about dogs and butterflies and bluebirds. And, um, and then I was talking to, to Peter Catapano, my editor at the Times, and I said, do you, do you think that's a good idea or do you think it would be better to try to find some kind of theme or some kind of overarching, um, you know, idea? Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, I think you're, you should make it a book. It should be a book. It shouldn't be just this disparate collection of essays. Right. And, um, and that was my, my, the, the tagline they put on all of my, essays, it says that I cover the flora, fauna, politics, and culture of the American South. So I thought, okay, well, what can I, what can, how can I put together a book that, oh, sorry, that makes it look like, um, you know, that presents a picture of the South. And that's what I did. So I started with flora, fauna, politics, and culture as my sections. Mm -hmm. And then I realized there's one way of looking at the flora and fauna that's really, um, just a kind of love letter to the natural world. Mm -hmm. And there's another way of looking at the flora and fauna that's really more of a, what are we going to do about the calamity right. we're facing? So I divided flora and fauna into two sections. One that's the first section, which is just the love letters and the other um, about the environment and, and various um, issues surrounding climate change and um, biodiversity collapse. And then I, under politics, I realized, okay, you can't have a book about the South without talking about religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the, I mean, that's sure. what they say about Nashville. It's that we're the buckle of the Bible belt. I don't know if that's true. I doubt that's true anymore. Yeah, I don't think so. But anyway, so that was one section. And then culture. Well, okay, there's, there's culture in the larger sense. And then there's the culture that produced me. So mm -hmm. I divided that section up. So there's a mm -hmm. culture section that has to do with people who are writing books and people who are um, singing songs and dancing in ballets. And then another section about my great grandmother's corn cakes. Right. Right. Okay. So the book starts with the flora and fauna section. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, like, that's where I put you. That's where I, when I think of you, that's the section I think of you in. So I was just wondering if those pieces were the pieces that were the most comfortable for you to write. Definitely. Absolutely. If they would let me do this every single week and that's all I would do. That's all I would do is I would pick um, something I love that maybe, maybe other people don't love. Like there's an essay in here about um, rattlesnakes and, and I, I can't say that I love rattlesnakes. I'm scared of them. Um, but I'm not, you're no fool. Well, they're they're but they're not truly dangerous. I had this big conversation back and forth with my editor and then with his editor and then with the copy editor, because they're all going like, how is there a difference between a da danger and threat? And rattlesnakes are dangerous, but they aren't threatening. They don't um, seek us out. Mm -hmm. They don't. Um, they even when we encounter them, they they hope will go away. And if we just hold still, they'll go away. It's those kinds of things I love. Like, look at this. I mean, that's what I want to do is that when I was teaching high school English at Harpeth Hall, my only philosophy as a teacher was love it in front of them. And if you love something in front of somebody, we are a species that is incredibly attuned to um, one another's emotions. Emotional states are very contagious. And so if I love something in front of somebody, there's a halfway decent chance they're going to love it too. Oh, or that's great. Give it, a night, give it a chance to love it. So I loved, yeah, those pieces were my favorites to write. And they always are my favorites to write. When you were a kid, did people used to say, do you see you later, not if I see you first? Which is what, what, we always, what, uh, what they always told us about rattlesnakes when I was growing up. Oh, yeah? So, you know, if you see the, the rattlesnake will see you and go away. So the only way that you would see a rattlesnake is if you saw the snake before the snake saw you. 
The um, that's true, and they're very. There's, they're, I follow a bunch of herpetologists on Twitter because they're, one does, and Instagram also because they put these cool pictures up, and they have these. A lot of them have these snakes tagged, and they check on them to see how they're doing because rattlesnakes are in trouble. Um, both how because do you tag a snake. I don't even want to know about that. <laughs> they have radio trans. Somehow they have, and so they go out looking for them. Mm -hmm. And they take pictures of them in their environment. And okay, so the picture will be on a screen this size, and I'll know there's a picture of a rattlesnake in that. There's a rattlesnake in that picture, and I don't see it. I cannot see it. I'm looking oh, at wow. it. It's like the 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 way they blend into the forest floor, the leaves and the dirt and the tree roots and the dappled light coming filtering down from the trees you can't see them they're just they're probably there every time you go hiking and you just never see them um anyway okay. so i know that the new york times is the newspaper of the country um you know taking away usa today but it's also a newspaper for new yorkers mm -hmm. they don't get rattlesnakes they don't at get all. rattlesnakes i mean it's kind of amazing that the new york times hires you to write about rattlesnakes you know, I think I have a theory about this. Please. I think that people, I don't think we're as evolved away from the natural world as we think we are. And, and I think we saw this, this last year, especially when people were in lockdown mm -hmm. and there's only so much time you can spend looking at a screen and people were looking out their windows and two things happened. People were looking out their windows, but also there were fewer people out on the street. And so the creatures we share the world with were mm -hmm. venturing closer to our habitations and they were venturing um, into our world more visibly. And we were noticing them because we were home. And that's true whether you live in a city or whether you live, there was a this wonderful video I saw of a, what was it? Like a groundhog eating a piece of pizza. Oh, I saw that. In Philadelphia, yeah. right on you the might, street. You might have sent it to me. Actually. I might have. <laughs> and 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 you know, like a like a cougar walking down the street, a mountain lion walking down the street of San Francisco, you know, a coyote walking right down a major eight-lane road in Chicago when Chicago is essentially shut down. Or the raccoon climbing the building in Minneapolis. Oh, that 28, 38 stories. And that's people just, those stories become viral because people do feel a kinship to the natural world and it doesn't matter where they live. And, um, you know, we, we sometimes have a little communication, um, issue with city people mm -hmm. who don't, who think any orange butterfly is a, is a monarch or, but, but they want to know the difference between a Gulf fritillary and a monarch. It, it, it's it's almost I think it's universal. Okay, I'm going to take us on to politics and religion. Oh. Why why are those two things together? Because in New York, again, going back to the people who actually started the New York Times, politics and religion are not hyphenated. Here they still are. You mean you think it for people in the city, those are the same thing? No, I think people in the city would say there's politics, there's religion, but they wouldn't put those two things together. Down here, we do put politics. We have no together. choice. I think it would be really wonderful if we didn't have to put them together. Um, when I was growing up, there were three things you did not discuss in polite society. You, okay. You did not discuss politics. You did not discuss religion and you did not discuss money. Those were. Oh, and sex. Oh yeah. But, that's just a given. That's a given. <laughs> like things you no nobody, one had, no nobody, nobody to wants to talk about their sex life in public, but they do kind of want to know what somebody else, how okay. much money they make, uh, or they want to know. And it's a natural question, especially in the rural South, where your um, so much of your identity and so much of your community life centers on your church. To say, oh, you know, where do you go to church? To assume that everybody goes to church, right, and that it's a denomination of Christianity, but, um, but we, and, and we have, you know, enshrined in our constitution, the requirement to keep religion and government separate, but religious people in the South have forgotten that if they ever knew it at all. And so it has become political. Mm -hmm. So where you go to church can determine a lot about your political orientation 
Um, I think I probably put it together not because of any of those reasons, but just because those are my least favorite things to write about. And if I combine them into one section, I didn't have to have as much. I didn't have to include as many of either one of them. I, I'm not afraid. I have opinions. I'm not afraid to write about my faith. I'm not afraid to write about my um, opinion of the Tennessee General Assembly. But it, I don't feel happy about doing it. It's not, it's not what I would prefer to write about. Right. Right. I mean, one of the things that I think about in my life is I have the luxury of turning off the news. Yeah. I, I can skip the paper for a couple of days. If I'm feeling down, overwhelmed, you know, I just don't. You've got to stay right in the white hot center of it 365 days a year. Is that correct? I always did though. Oh, really? I, I always okay. have been. Um, I don't know why exactly. I've always, I, I think it's because Ronald Reagan was president, got elected president my, um, my first year of college. Mm -hmm. And so my, my awakening as an adult and as, as an adult citizen happened um, on the watch of somebody whose politics I found reprehensible. And I, and I, so at, at a time when I was really trying, uh, cutting my teeth as an American citizen, I felt this strong sense that um, the Republic was in my hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's only, you know, an 18 year old could possibly really think is that, um, you know, it was all going to go to hell if I wasn't paying attention. And I never really got over that. I don't think. How in the world do we get people back involved and in feeling that way again? People are pretty involved. I think, yeah. I mean, they're, they're the biggest problem right now is I mean, in 1980, there were three networks. You know, right. you got your news from Dan. Well, I got because not Dan rather that early. But I mean, I remember my father, you know, wasn't consistently Walter Cronkite, but it was either Huntley and Brinkley or Walter Cronkite. Right. Every every morning he read the morning paper. We had two newspapers even right. in Birmingham, Alabama. Every evening he read the the evening paper and he sat down and he watched the network news every night. Wow. That was what everybody did yeah and consequently what they had was the same set of facts they had the same political framework they didn't share the same opinion about what to do about that situation or how to think about it but they all at least shared the same facts or the same um uh as much as we knew about the truth that's not true anymore so everybody has an opinion but does everybody actually know what they're talking about? No. no. Um, I think that the piece that feels like such a gift is the one on Jimmy Carter, because that he does seem to be where religion and politics come together so peacefully and beautifully. That's, I guess, the, um, the benefit of age. I mean, he's seen some stuff, but um it was for me. That experience was very much. I went to hear Jimmy Carter teach Sunday school in Plains, Georgia. I had countless opportunities to do that. I mean, when he when he lost to to Ronald Reagan, he came back after he after Reagan's inauguration in January of 1981. Jimmy Carter came back to Plains, Georgia, which was not even two hours from where I was in college at Auburn University, mm. but I didn't have a car. And, um, and then I married a man from Southwest Georgia who's, uh, who, 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 whose parents lived maybe 15 miles from oh, wow. Jimmy Carter's house in Plains. And at any given t Sunday morning, then we were down there four or five times a year, I could have gone to hear him, um, teach Sunday school, but, but that Sunday was the traveling day and we had to get little kids back to Nashville at seven and a half or eight hour drive away. So I, it, I always missed the chance and I always wanted to. And there was something about the election of Donald Trump that made me feel like I needed to, it, it, you know, it was now or never. Right. Because he is, he is, um, you know, he was, I don't know. He, he made me feel better. 
Have you ever gone to Memphis to hear Al Green? No, I should do that. Oh, I should totally I, that do I have that. done. That I have done. Um, that is a, an amazing experience. And also, at least the one time that I did that, the people in that church were not tourists. They were congregants. There right. was not some crazy overflow situation. It, oh, it, there was this place. Yeah. They built the Maranatha Baptist Church is huge, even though it has, I don't know, 50 full, you know, parishioners or whatever. I, I don't know what Baptists called it. But anyway, they, they, the, the, but the sanctuary holds hundreds and, and, you know, Jimmy Carter was saying, you know, do we have any guests here this week? And it was a, obviously a, a standing joke because right. there were people there from Zimbabwe and there, you know, wow. Wow. you know, Brussels. It was crazy. Wow. Okay. So social justice, this is the third section of the book. And for me, the most moving, um, the, the pieces that really grabbed my heart and choked me up were in the social justice section of the book. Margaret is now checking the book I am. Uh, to Which say one? what okay. what is so deeply moving. What America is to me. Oh, God. Yes. Tell, tell us about that story. And then you can tell us about John Lewis and you can tell us about ICE. Everything in the social justice section just brought me to my knees in the best way. I feel like I, 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 I have to keep explaining to people that we're going to have to there are a lot of things that are considered political in this world that are not political. They have been politicized. So, for example, COVID. Yes, class. Exactly. COVID, immigration, um, the environment. The, these kinds of things have been politicized, but we have a lot of common ground from the right and the left on these issues. Um, you know, and I think that there are things that are political politicized that we're never going to agree on. We are absolutely never, ever, ever going to agree on abortion, but we can agree on a reasonable immigration policy. We absolutely can do that. We can agree on um, the emergency that we're in, um, where the environment is concerned. We might we may have to fiddle around the edges with what to do about that, but we know what we have to do and we're going to have to do it. And it doesn't matter whether you're voting for Republican candidates or, or Democratic candidates or somebody in a third party. It doesn't matter. We're going to do that. It, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, we are going to, we're going to have to deal with these things. So when Donald Trump was elected and I was so depressed, I mean, really, truly right. Like depressed. Um, I there were, I had clipped out of the church bulletin a little invitation for anybody who wanted to sign up to help in the, a class in a uh, an English language learners classroom in Nashville, and they had put at that time um, all the the new immigrants to Nashville, regardless of where they're from, in the same classroom because even though they all spoke different languages from one another, they were facing the same right. issues in learning this crazy language. I mean, it's in the same language that we speak and, and also this kind of crazy culture. And so they, the teachers needed volunteers and I volunteered. i had been holding on to that for, I don't even know how long. And then I thought, okay, well the people. It's like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Donald Trump like catapulted right. me into like actually doing something about many different ideas I had. But my son, my oldest son is a public school, middle school teacher here in Nashville. And almost all of his students are from other countries and they were absolutely devastated by, mm -hmm. they were terrified and yeah. devastated. And so that just told me I needed to go volunteer. And I did. And it was for one semester. I just went and just did whatever the teacher told me to do. And usually that was sit at a table with a group of students and help them with an assignment. If they anybody who didn't quite get what they were supposed to do. And I was just so struck by how there were these types of students that matched exactly my memory 
of the types of students in the suburban high school I had taught 20 something years. The private, before. fancy private girl school. Right. right. But also my public high school in Alabama. There's always going to be the beautiful girl who knows she's beautiful <laughs> and who has every boy in that class wrapped around her finger. There's always going to be the class clown there's, wow. who's trying wow. to make everybody laugh. There's always going to be the kid who's doing this and hoping you're not noticing that he's asleep. There's, it's just the yeah. universality of that experience was just so remarkable to me, but also just how hard these kids were working to belong to this country that had just elected somebody who was telling them that they did not belong anyway. I'm going to start crying. Okay. okay but you know that I'm listening to you and I'm thinking week after week, don't you feel like I want to, I want this to be a book. Like I just want to stop everything and write a book about this classroom and these people and this experience. Cause that's what would happen to me. Well, and you could do it and, and you could, I can't probably, oh, please. but it, there's, um, you have to make a decision as a writer, I think pretty early in your life. Are you going to be, at least as a nonfiction writer, are you going to be an expert in something that you're completely and totally absorbed by and passionate about? Are you going to learn everything there is to learn about humpback whales? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to learn a tiny little bit about everything? And I picked the tiny little bit about everything just because I don't have the kind of brain that um, is capable of achieving expertise. <laughs> I just, I like the, you know, I just, I, I don't need to write a whole book about everything. Okay. Um, but I do fall in love every week with whatever, unless it's the Tennessee general assembly, right. I fall in love <laughs> almost every week with what I'm writing about last, this past week, I wrote about the Fisk Jubilee singers. They just, um, yeah. celebrated, um, 150 years. And I read a couple of books about them. I watched a documentary. I went and heard them practice. I interviewed their director, Paul He's, Kwame. Oh, I love him. And He's amazing. Oh, so amazing. Such a great guy. And it's, and it's like, no, I don't want to write a book about the Fist Jubilee singers, but I do just want to move into their rehearsal space and right. hear them sing every day. Right, 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 right. Okay, so the environment. Now, this is the section. This is the fourth section of the book. And this is the section that really has had the biggest impact on my little life personally. Um, I never used Mosquito Joe, but before I knew you and before I started reading your columns, um, the person who mows the lawn would spray every year so, oh. we, wouldn't, so we wouldn't get uh, violets. Our, our entire yard is violets. Uh, I've never killed a mole, but now all the moles in the neighborhood have moved into our yard. We call it, we call it Moltopia of Moltropolis. And, um, and I'm so fine with it, thanks to you. But this is the place where I feel that you're teaching me something. And I, and I really value that because I think that everybody wants to do better, but we don't really know how. So talk about how we can do better. Also, the case against doing nothing, um, which is in this yeah. section, mm -hmm. uh, which is such an important essay. You know, I almost didn't even put that in there because it's not really about the South exactly. But um, it's about being alive in the South and everywhere else. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I took an environmental biology class when I was at Auburn and nobody in 1984 was talking about this stuff. Nobody was talking about that, that I knew, certainly not in right. Alabama, talking about the carrying capacity of the planet or talking about the, um, you know, the, the trash heaps in the oceans or, and it just made a profound, profound uh, difference in how I thought about my life and I thought about the world. And, um, I think partly that was because, you know, I was a barefoot wild child in in rural Alabama. And so we were talking about my home 
you know, I, we lived right. in a million different little places. Um, my, when we moved to Birmingham, a lot had to leave our, our home in lower Alabama. And I didn't have a home that was a, a house. I had a home that was pine trees and mockingbirds and blue jays. And, and so being told what danger that home was in truly changed my life. So the environment section, and, and then again, um, with the social justice, with the environment, these are not political issues. We actually have, um, a, a, the politicians don't believe the polls apparently, and people do have higher priorities than the environment when they vote. They tend to vote on other issues than how a political figure views the environment. But we all pretty much, we really have a, an amazing amount of common ground in what we, how we feel about rivers and how we feel about oceans and how we feel about endangered creatures. Um, and so I just believe um, that most people, if you, most people are doing what they're doing with regard to their yard or how they live, what they buy in the grocery store, the packaging, it comes in. Not because they have any philosophical attachment to bottled water, not because they have any strong feelings about whether violets in their yard or not. It's because it's just habitual. Right. It's just easy. Everybody else has green grass. That's what they're hiring this lawn service. This is why they want their grass to be green too, because it's just, it's not a matter of any thought at all. They don't, they, they aren't making bad choices. They're just not aware that there is a choice. Right. And so, um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said um, in terms of how limited what an individual can do, real, how much it really matters. I mean, definitely the fossil fuel industry wants us to think it's all in our hands and it isn't it's in their hands it's in the politicians hands who are holding the fossil fuel industry accountable but there's still something empowering about seeing a disaster unfolding on your watch and feeling that there's something you can do about it and there's a lot you can do about it you we aren't powerless and and like if every single person on this street stopped spraying herbicides and stop to spraying insecticides, the natural world would rebound instantly. Yeah. It's like it's nature truly abhors a vacuum. You stop spraying for insects and insects come. And when you stop spraying for insects, birds come to eat your insects. And what the birds do is bring the wildflower seeds in their in their droppings. They they poop and pokeweed jumps up out of the ground. I got a free tomato plant this year from that exact thing. So, so it's, it's, it's not anything that you have to actively do in most cases. You just have to stop doing the wrong thing. Uh, it's amazing how many people really believe that Mosquito Joe just kills mosquitoes. Well, that's what they tell you, isn't and, it? And right. So they don't think, well, the reason that there are no lightning bugs in my yard, the reason there are no butterflies and no bees you know, they were just going to come and kill the mosquitoes. And anyway, so. Uh, or they'll think, they'll see the sign and it'll say organic. And it's like. So is arsenic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hemlock is organic. Yeah. I don't recommend you drink it. Right. Okay. Family and community, um, which is sort of the section where you just get to be you. And, and also, okay, now this is an interesting question. Writing about your family. Um, and and the community that's really close to you, how do you make decisions about what you're going to write about and what you're not going to write about? See, it's, see, only another writer would ask that question because you see it as a decision. Every most readers, I think, assume that it's all in there. Oh golly! Like if you wrote about your family, there are no omissions. Wow. Um, and they and there's a little. Yeah. different different writers fall on different places on the continuum. You know, I think of Anne Lamott who says, you know, if you didn't want to be, if your if your family didn't want to be written about, they should have behaved better. You know, it's like um, I don't feel that way. You know, I I wouldn't I would never write anything that anybody I loved f 
found too revealing or, or um, upsetting in any way. My people, a lot of people assume that my first book, um, that I waited so late to write it because I had to wait for my parents to die. And that's not true. My parents mm -hmm. were absolutely it's terrible. <laughs> they were, they loved mm -hmm. every word I ever wrote about them. And they would, you know, cut it out of the newspaper or cut it out of the magazine and take it to Kinko's and make copies and give it to everybody right. at church. Right. That That's the kind of parents they were. Um, but when, like in this book, there's an essay about uh, my son and daughter-in-law's pandemic wedding. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking about. I would not have written that piece without their permission. And I would not have um, published a word of it if they hadn't read it in advance. I mean, that's, they, that was all on them, but they, they loved the idea. A lot of people do kind of love the idea. And I was so careful to only let the, uh, the, photo editor have pictures in which their faces were obscured and I've never used their names in print. And then they wanted the caption for the photo to have their names in it because they didn't want anybody to be confused about who it was. And so, you know, I just think you'd be, you're careful about um, other people's feelings and you're okay. Also, if for me, there's, it's very clear, you know, like I can write about something but I know what to leave out instinctually. I'm not even thinking about it. And the story that you wrote about your son and daughter-in-law's wedding for the New York Times was not the story that you told me as a friend sitting on your front porch. You know, they're just, they're different versions of things and they're both equally true. They're not in conflict. It's just right, what exactly what is appropriate for a public audience and what's appropriate for a friend Two two different things. Um, one of the things that I really love about writing personal essays is I always think of it as sort of pressing flowers or leaves in a book that you can take moments of your life and write them down and, and put them in the newspaper or put them in a book as a way of keeping them because our memories fail. I mean, we're both at that time in our lives where, you know, I'm thinking, I don't remember everybody I went to high school with anymore. Yeah, you know, things really start to fall away. And I feel so glad about the memories that I put into writing. So you don't have to carry them around with you forever. Well, there is a way that they get fixed by writing, though. And, and I think you do have to be careful about when you commit a memory to words, because the memory is partly in words and partly in other uh, sense experience. And um, once it's written in words, that's what it that's, it becomes fixed. Right. Sally Mann talks about that in her book, Hold Still, about photography, how then her children remember things in terms of looking at the pictures. Right. They're, they're remembering the pictures and not actually the day. And I remember, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember my childhood in terms of those pictures also. Yeah. Not nearly so many pictures as Sally Mann's children have of their childhood. But I do think you have to be careful. You don't want to write that memory down. You don't want to get it fixed too soon. Yeah. You need to have it. And it needs to have some room to breathe for a while first. I particularly love the piece about taking your son to see Santa. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. And, and actually also how that plays against your son's wedding. And then we have this sense of time. Um, yeah. Yeah. For a long time, um, you know, those those Christmas and Thanksgiving essays came out of the fact that I was kind of one of the only people not taking Thanksgiving and Christmas off. You know, the real columnists were taking were on vacation. And so I was thinking trying to think of something that would be seasonal. But um but yeah there there's um there is a sense I have all these memories and I am gonna lose them especially that child you know, it was just a toddler when I took him to the Santa. I will never forget the Santa. Yeah. I'll never forget the surly Santa. Right. But um, but that child's going to be 30 on his next birthday. I'm just not mm -hmm. going to remember the baby stories forever. So I need to, I do need to put, put him down somewhere. Yeah. Okay. In the last section of the book, arts and culture. Yeah. That one is a fun, that's a fun section to write too. People always ask me, do you have a favorite? Um 
do you have a favorite piece you've ever written for the times? And, and the truth is I, I don't, I don't have a favorite. I have favorite subjects to write about, but I love it when I get to talk to somebody who's doing something fascinating or I get to go and see something amazing. And so in that section, you know, I got to write about John Prine, you know, John Prine, John Prine and, um, and quote his songs and quote that. What a gift that was that you got to quote those songs. That's thanks to Fiona. Yeah. Who who gave me permission, but he's, you know, I really, I, I went to that concert. Um, and of course I've known John Prine's work for my entire adult life, but he, um, he just seemed like I realized, okay, we need a Bob Dylan for this age. You know, we need um, we need our our troubadours to help guide us through. And he's been doing that for so long. Yeah. Or I got to go um, our our local poet, Caroline Randall Williams, who whose um, collection of poems, Lucy Negro Redux, got turned into a ballet by the Nashville Ballet. That was a transcendent experience. I got to um, I got to interview um, Sarah Fuller, the Vanderbilt soccer player who got to who became the first um, woman to play football in, in the Power Five co- conferences and and to talk with her about what that was like um, to to kick through the glass ceiling, as she put it. <laughs> Those experiences are really are fun because they because they make you just fall in love with the human race, just how creative and how um, strong and resilient and beautiful we can be. It also just is this constant reminder of what a great job it is to have an excuse to go to people and say, I, you know, tell me what you're doing. Yeah. Tell me all about you. Tell me what you're interested in because people this is such a lesson in life. People want to tell you. People really do want to share what they care about. It's amazing. I, I have that experience exactly how I need to be a better listener in my life when I, it, it's a reminder when I interview somebody because they, people will tell you they want to be heard. And it's not just because you're writing for a national publication. It's because People just want to be heard and they do yeah. want to share their enthusiasms. And yeah, there are lots of times like when I was interviewing Zach Richardson and walking through, you know, uh, the the park where he had his, he's an urban shepherd where he had his sheep oh, pastured during the, yeah. um, the lambing season and seeing these day old lambs just leaping, literally leaping into the spring sunshine and thinking, I cannot believe people are paying me to do this. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that you would have missed it otherwise, if not for the job. Right. You would have gone your whole life without knowing that there were galloping lambs so close by. That's right. Okay. So it's not hard to come up with an idea every week because they're everywhere. That's do you, right. Do you ever get stumped? No. I love that. No, I ha- I keep a running list and it's pages long that sometimes there are links attached to subjects um, in case I need to come because I will come back. I know I'm going to come back to something about polluted water or something about um, mosquito gel. I'm going to come back to those. So I'm saving uh, links to research, but um, but I don't I don't really need a list. There's all you have to do is just open your eyes. Um, I have to say, this is amazing. We were supposed to talk for 45 minutes. We are at 44 minutes and 33 seconds on the live clock. Ladies and gentlemen, Margaret Rankle, Graceland at last, available at your local independent bookseller, Parnassus Books, available everywhere. It is, But it's all, they're all signed. But at these Parnassus. are all signed at Parnassus Books. I'm going to do this. But also, I just want to say, I found this book to be such a comfort and joy because it really gave me the material I needed to be helpful and to be a better citizen a more informed citizen and to live a better life. It's a gift. It's a great gift for everyone on your list. 
buy the copies in bulk. <laughs> this is what you want. I'm and, your bookseller. But we're just all going to mention, too, since you're dressed. We're out of town. We're no, no, we're town. just going to me mention for one second. Pre-order now. Coming, ne <laughs> coming next month. And Paget the Novelist has written a collection of essays. Which is why the essayists get together and talk. Yeah. Um, enjoy Southern Festival of Books. We love Southern Festival of Books. Margaret used to be the Southern Festival of Books. Well, documented anyway. Um, and uh, thank you. For, thank you. I'm so glad that we got to be in one screen, too. If yeah, not, that was a good idea. Yes. Yeah, if yeah. not on the legislative plaza together, in my den together. Next year on the plaza. Absolutely. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.